Okay, um, I am aware it's quite late in the day, so <coughs> I'll try to be brief. Um, I'd like to go back in time a little bit with a little prelude. And <coughs> I guess one reason why we're all here is that we believe, or we hope, that event-based vision will change the world, of vision at least. And so if, if this turns out to be at least partly true, then we're going to need, firstly, a community of developers. I think we see that's developing quite nicely, um, judged by all of you here. And we also need methods for quantifying the benefits. Um, this I mean at several different levels. First, you know, how is it better? What are the applications? How do we compare the different sensors? You know, we don't have a standard. Everyone's quoting crazy statistics about how great their sensor is, including ourselves. And so we need ways of standardizing this. Um, now, if we go back to the first time that um, the DVS was used outside the lab that created it, this was back in 2005. Um, this is actually the first end-to-end um, -end neuromorphic visual system. So you can see somewhere in that mess of wires is a DVS. And it was doing object segmentation, detection, classification into a large object and a small object. Right? And th this required several years of work to have basically two other groups using the DVS. Now, a couple of years later, um, Toby added two significant innovations. Um, one was a bias generator, so people didn't have to tune potentiometers by hand, and the second thing was a USB cable. Um, this sounds trivial, but you'd be surprised how many people said, oh, that's too hard. Then once we put a USB cable on it, then suddenly, oh, I get it. Um, since then, <coughs> at least to our knowledge, um, the DVS is in use at at least 250 organizations. This started off firstly at universities, and then as time went on, um, more and more companies. Um, and these companies have been in all sorts of fields, so from industrial vision, consumer electronics, automotive, of course, aerospace, also service companies and um, computing companies who want to build processing um, for this type of sensor. And so in today's talk, I'd like to comment briefly on three things. Um, first, on the software aspects. How do we make it easier? How can we decide what type of applications make sense um, to use using, to, to do using this type of technology? And what type of hardware um, can we use to maximize the benefits of this technology? So first to the software. Um, the way we've always gone from the start is to try and be as open as possible without going bankrupt. Um, and the problems we always heard with DVS development was it's too hard, right? We've been working on that. And another big one is I can't use OpenCV. I love OpenCV. It's so easy. And so <coughs> the approach we've taken was we provide a development environment that everyone can use, open source, provide some pre-built modules to do certain things, and then interface to whatever you want, right? If you have TensorFlow, you can interface to that. Um, if you have some particular operating system, some programming language, you can interface to that. And so the first phase of this was with um, a Java framework and with a C driver, where people built all sorts of stuff. Whatever you can think of, someone tried to do it. I'm not saying it was any good, but they tried to do it. Right? And so if you look in JAR, there are over 250 things that people tried to do using the sensor. And out of those sort of initial attempts, um, many things have crystallized. Um, <coughs> over the years, the number of downloads, this is starting at two, in 2007, actually, um, the number of downloads slowly increased. Uh, we had to stop counting in 2016 because we shifted from SourceForge, which does count the number of downloads, over to Git, which doesn't, unfortunately. So this was a useful exploratory phase um, where we could sort of get a feeling for what the community was interested in. And this led us to then develop a more robust solution, which we're just releasing now. Um, so this will be, it was written from ground up in C, C++, open API. We decoupled the GUI from the engine. Um, it's cross-platform as before. It's not, develop, uh, it's not dependent on our particular chips. And it has, as before, the interfaces to the different uh, compute environments. Um, how it looks, you can uh, come and check it out at our booth afterwards. So you have, as you would expect, a live viewer. Um, in the top right corner is uh, one of the simple image reconstruction 
algorithms running in real time, then the frames, and IMU output. This can be decoupled from the actual instance running the software, which then connects the camera. Another feature of this is the um, graphical data flow definition um, interface. So that this live display you saw here is um, defined using this um, data flow that you see here. Um, so you have uh, up the top the camera itself, then on the side there's a noise filter on the right hand side, and then on the left hand side you have an accumulator that's doing the image reconstruction, and down the bottom you have the visualizer. So we want to try to get it to the stage where people who have no background in this type of thing can get a camera, plug it in, and do something vaguely interesting. Then they have the API but with some examples where they can get started as quickly as possible. And this will hopefully help to further accelerate the growth of a community of people working on this type of technology. I'd like to say a, a word now about the applications. Right? Uh, how do we choose the best applications? It's the billion dollar question that everyone's asking. You know, where does it work best? And how do I decide? Right? And we've heard today you know, several possible ways of evaluating this. So you have the low latency aspect, which is good if you need to react fast. There's the HDI, if you need to see stuff that you can't otherwise see. And then there's the energy efficiency aspect. Now to simplify this problem a lot, what you can do is look at the relationship between single events then what we call event frames. This is basically bundles of events that are being sent across at high, high frame rates. So these are sort of like um, high frame rate diff images. Um, there are various technical reasons for why people have shifted from single event um, data transmission to event frame, mainly related to bandwidth overhead. And so if we can quantify using this sort of common denominator um, by how much DVS can beat normal frames, then maybe we can have uh, some kind of insight uh, into how, <coughs> how the advantages of DVS can play out, given a lot of assumptions, of course, right, which we can discuss later. So you formulate the problem as a certain amount of system power available. Then you have some target frame rate which you want to achieve for your application. Right? You've already done it before using conventional vision and you have an idea of how fast you need to be. And so then you, you know how much energy it requires to perform the diff image using conventional uh, vision. You have to make certain assumptions about the amount of energy to do the processing for each algorithm step. And then your output is how much power do you have left, right? And for a super efficient system, you want this margin to be as close to zero as possible. And so you grind out some equations, which are not that hard, and you come up with regions where, in the bottom part, you can, do, you can solve your problem using frames, or you can use DVS, it doesn't matter. Um, what you're not seeing is coming out of the page, out of the screen, is the power margin, the, the advantage you gain using DVS. So far away from the red line, the advantage is basically neg negligible. And the closer and closer you get to the red line, the margin increases until you're into that central section where this can only be done using DVS. And then the blue line marks the um, border of um, what's basically impossible given the um, constraints you put on the problem. So again, we, you know, this, is, this is based on a lot of assumptions, but I'm hoping that this is a, we're hoping this is a useful way to start to try and think about in a quantitative way um, how DVS technology might um, be better than normal frames. So just, just a few words now about the um, hardware. Um, so again, we have the question, you know, what hardware works best with DVS? We've had lots of hints this afternoon about um, where it works best. And I think two key principles are first, the some sort of ASIC is probably going to be best. Right? I think we all probably agree with that. Um, and the, <coughs> the power consumption should be dependent somehow on what's going on in the scene. Right? You shouldn't be processing nothing like crazy. Otherwise, you might as well have used a normal frame sensor. And so I'll just uh, close with two small examples um, where we've been looking into this. Um, 
The first is looking at noise filtering in the sensor array itself. Um, so we've built a chip where we take groups of four pixels and we work on the assumption that if one of those pixels is active during a certain time window, then it was probably noise. You can configure how you wanted to deal with um, different numbers of pixels active in different time windows. And so by doing this, you can basically act as a first stage filter by reducing the number of pixels you're passing on to the rest of the system. If it's noise, you don't even want it to get off the chip. <coughs> um, also with this, uh, we also worked on a getting an ultra low power um, version of the chip. So for example, this particular chip runs at, uh, what is that, 250 microwatts. Uh, to give you an example of the type of output you can get, um, on the left-hand side, you can see um, noise reduction in a, the classic spinning fan demo. Um, so here we reduce the amount of data by about 40%. And on the right-hand side is a flicker reduction um, demo where we can reduce the amount of data by a lot more. Um, again, just by looking at the patterns of activation at, at the chip level. The other example is with our sister company um, called AI Cortex. Um, here we're looking at spike-based neural computation interface directly to the DVS chip, so without any intervening software layer or, or firmware layer. Um, there are two versions of the technology we're looking at. Um, the first one is using analog neurons. Um, there's a controversy about whether that's necessary. Analog versus digital is better, which we can discuss later. Um, nevertheless, we have um, prototype boards available for developers to work with. Our latest chip is a digital CNN accelerator. This one's significantly larger, um, so with a million neurons, four million parameters, so able to um, start to handle some uh, interesting problems from a machine vision point of view. To give you a very simple example, uh, this is um, a simulation, because we just got the chip back, um, of uh, recognition, in this case, of the diff different team members um, us using the chip. And the next step is then to see if we can combine the, the DVS and the neural network processing onto a single chip. And so we announced uh, at the start of this year um, the development of what we decided to call SPEC, like a speck of dust. The idea is that it's a single self-contained chip that does something useful. And in this case, um, very simple um, recognition activities. For example, detecting a face or detecting a human versus a non-human. And the goal is to go for extremely low power consumption. So in this case, below one milliwatt for always on applications. Um, so this we're expecting to have um, ready for sampling in Q3, hopefully. Okay, um, that's all I'd like to say today. Um, thanks very much for your attention. Um, we'd be very glad to welcome you to come and have a look at our stuff um, booth 1554. Thank you.